Okay. <laughs> so, um, so this, I really feel a little bit like I'm in drag because I haven't done an academic thing like this, a public gig in about a year and a half, but it's good um, prologue for I did agree to do a colloquium, a kind of retrospective thing up in, uh, at UBC in Vancouver in early April. So I agreed partly to see if I could still remember how this all works. But, <laughs> But also, I didn't have any of these papers in advance, and so this is all just, you know, top of the head kind of commentary uh, based on this. So just to continue a little bit about the, um, from the remarks that I spontaneously made this morning for those of you who were here, um, I guess I've been involved in kind of queer family discourse from before there was such a discourse. Um, I really am a kind of, I, when I, in the end of teaching, um, I used to, teach my gender and um, sexuality courses as a sort of living diorama of the sedimented layers of feminism and, um, and queer studies over the uh, decades, and now there are quite a few of them, because I really was part of the very first generation, and there weren't programs like this. We created them, and they've morphed in many ways over the time. Um, and I can't help but I've been struck over and over again by the enormous shift in the position between feminism, I've been asked to sort of make comments on feminism and queer families and reproductive, uh, what else, on, uh, what was I, what was my thing, queer families and uh, feminism, and I forget what else I was asked to comment on, but it was, I don't think it was reproductive, just, surrogacy. no, it wasn't that, oh, surrogacy, okay, so, um, but from the earliest stages of um, feminism of my generation, which was then called women's lib, and um, what was very soon after called gay lib in the Stonewall era, um, both movements and uh, were positioned as anti-family, as a threat to the family, as anti-reproduction, as a threat to reproduction, anti-procreative. Um, we were that was a major way in which we were perceived, and a lot of the culture wars that emerged after that that then sort of directed what a lot of our work, for, especially those of us who wound up staying in the field of uh, that ultimately, as I did in family studies, both in a transnational and in a domestic setting, were involved in um, uh, positioning ourselves within first the feminist critique of family life and um, including what later became words like heteronormativity, words we didn't have at that moment. Um, and then later, in the defensive mode in relationship to the rise of the politics of family values under the, um, which was the backlash against feminism and gay liberation, which included elements within the feminist movement. So there were the struggles fought within feminism over sexuality and over race. And I'm thinking back and we had some very, very early initiatives that did join um, reproductive justice to a feminist imagining of parenthood. Um, which was often non-gendered. I'm thinking of Carassa, for example, way back, I think it was in the 70s or certainly the 80s, which I don't know if I remember what the it stood for, but it was Coalition Against Racism, something or other, and Reproduction, something or other like that. And that grew out of a socialist feminist politics that a lot of us were part of coming out of the movements of the 60s in both civil rights at the time and then black power and the anti-war movement, which led to the formation of things like the women's unions and Marxist feminism. Oh, he would rather see the audience too, I guess. And um, so that was the context for our early um, thinking and our politics. And many of us, and I was one of them, became sociologists or entered the academy as a product of feminism. We didn't become feminists in the academy, we actually got to be in the academy in part because of our desire to pursue the origins of male domination or things of that sort. I actually had been a junior high and high school teacher before and it's pretty ironic because I'm devolving rapidly. I really have left the academy and now I'm just a citizen and doing various volunteer work and I work both with a program called College Track that helps some um, underserved high school youth get into college working on their college admissions essays in my case and their scholarship applications and all. But also I've now become a story time giver in a Head Start program in East Oakland uh, working with the Oakland Public Library System. So the literature I'm reading this, these days are things like um, um, Charlie Parker 
and um, rap a tap tap, <laughs> and Mr. Bojangles, and uh, stories like this. And um, so it'll be really a switch to think about this literature. So I'm really thinking about the astonishing transformation of the discourse on families within feminism and gay liberation from a very anti critical stance, which included an a kind of an aversion even to procreation itself, not among all feminists or whatever, but I thought, and I mentioned at lunch, um, one of the foundational um, books of, of the radical feminism of my period, which was Shulamith Firestone's The Dialectic of Sex, which had this vision um, of a future in which we wouldn't have to reproduce, it would all be test two babies, and women would be liberated from the constraints of biology. And so the complicated relationships between biology, technology, the law, the human, the non-human, and the notion of what the connection was between biology and destiny, and especially within the feminist context, the concern about reproduction as the sort of root of, of women's disability is really interesting. And we were often criticized for our anti-natalism. So I love the title of... Um, the talk of make kin not babies because it was one of the it resurrected a lot of what i saw as the queer family promise and the queer queer family politics that we had sort of um cherished in the earlier period that has really kind of gone by the wayside um the other thing was there was the development of the anti um tech it was both Firestone turned, to, turned out to be an anomaly. Very few feminists after, after her celebrated technology as a form of liberation from women's bodies. Quite the opposite took over, which was the celebration of women's bodies, the celebration, though in a critical frame, like Adrienne Riches of Women Born, um, but sometimes much more radically pure celebration, like Susan Griffin's um, On Women and Nature and things of that sort. So the discussion flipped around um, quite a bit. But then I remember another important intervention, and Donna Haraway's name got mentioned here today too, of the Cyborg Manifesto. And that introduced a very interesting shift in a moment of beginning to think about and be critical of kind of the celebratory feminist celebration of women's difference and of women's biological capacity and, and um, procreative abilities and trying to liberate them from systems of domination, but beginning to imagine a world in which you couldn't quite define the borders of the human. And I saw a lot of the work today taking up some of those ideas in ways that I think are thrilling to people of my generation, or at least to some of us, who don't reject the younger feminists as being all retro and not appreciating us. So <laughs> maybe you have to really retire to not care if they appreciate you anymore. But <laughs> so, um, and I was very struck because I did so much research among gay men, which it turns out I became better known for two articles that I co-published than I did for, and that's often the case, there's the Stacey theorem hypothesis of uh, the inverse relationship between effort and reward, because I got so much more acclaim and mileage and um, invitations out of a few casual articles, not those weren't casual, but uh, out of articles that I wrote than I did out of all of the books I did all put together. And so <laughs> I decided, you know, for example, something like, can there be a feminist ethnography, which Josh, you should read if you haven't, uh, yeah, because it addresses, and there's, it's part of a whole conversation of lots of other people that address some of the issues that you raised about those questions of the ethics of representation and disclosure. And, and based on that, I even in my Brave New Families book, published as an appendix, the, a critique of my book by one of its principal informants, whose wonderful last lines were, you could never capture me, and, um, which was absolutely correct. And nobody could ever capture any of us in terms that would be satisfactory to us or that would be satisfactory in, in, in the end. So I'm interested in, in that, but especially in the shift within the normalization of gays, which has been just dramatic in, in the um, advanced industrial societies in my lifetime. And you know, I've written elsewhere about my ambivalent participation in the um, same-sex marriage rights movement, uh, which was aided a lot by the work I did with Tim Biblars at USC on how does the sexual orientation of parents matter and how does the gender of parents matter. And those became far more influential and important. 
and help to feed, despite my own politics and my own framing, they help to participate in the normalization of a form of gay family life that was decreasingly, as Marcine says, queer and increasingly normalized and excluding. And even many of my subjects, in um, my gay male subjects, who were part of, some of whom were part of the Pop Luck Club in LA, which was a gay father support group that started in 1999, um, that still exists but now is barely needed. In that period, it started with nine men who were thinking about how they could become um, parents. And I was there a few years later in the West Hollywood playground, by the way, uh, (laughs) where the uh, Friday dads would meet after they already had, now they had some da- some kids through a whole range of means, adoption, surrogacy, co-parenting, all kinds of arrangements, um, some from prior relationships. And they would meet in the West Hollywood playground and had a very poignant movement. Um, many people may not know that among the um, dead in the um, plane crashes in um, 9-11, was a gay family of two of the original founding members of the Pop Luck Club of gay dads and their child who perished in the plane from Boston. They had been visiting in Boston. And so the Pop Luck Club was dedicating a, a stone with a, with a plaque on it in, in that space. And the Pop Luck Club does answer some of the question that Marcin was asked. It was a community context, and they were trying to raise their kids a little bit more together. And there was a lot more of that because there was more need of it. And now there is much less need, depending on where you are, and which society and which part of the society. And so there are many more opportunities for a form of normalization that some of us mourn. So I think a lot about how Um, the conversation between um, the kind of Michael Warner critique of normal and or the more recent David Halperin, what do gay men want, um, uh, considerations of uh, risk and really risky sex and stuff like that in relationship to the shift to wanting inclusion and all of that and how to fit a conversation like that into the one on reproductive justice. And I think today is a great start but I didn't find the two conversations intersecting very much because the reproductive justice conversation is obviously one primarily that's a kind of negative discourse on queer family, not meant to be, but in the sense it's it's a cautionary tale. It's primarily critical impulses about the exploitative relationships that are often involved in anything involving technology and biology when it involves relationships of inequality among the so-called donors or the laborers or the recipients or clients or anything like that. And um, I heard a few moments of people here raising the possibility, such as in um, Windance's notion of a um, perhaps a a global regulatory framework. I mean, that seems pretty idealistic, but you know, there are UN frameworks for that and all. They're always very problematic and but maybe worth pursuing on some level. I don't know how much, you know, they're more symbolic generally. They have no enforcement teeth, but those would be interesting things to pursue and consider. But queer kinship within queer studies had a very sort of celebratory kind of um, self-congratulatory tone to it. And um, reproductive justice has the opposite tone. And so it's very interesting. I don't mean that justice would be celebratory, but the it's much more focused on critique. And so I was thinking of the two discourses that Josh thought about, not just about the celebratory, what great new novel families we have, which I slightly contributed to as well in some of the stories that I told within um, my last book, on Unhitched, but, um, but trying to put them within a frame of integrating them into the structural analysis of where that fit in the society as a whole and watching even my subjects finding that they didn't see people making their choices. They didn't see younger gay men making the choices that they had made, which were more communitarian in that period because they needed to be. And, but also because they were still excited by, by these ideas of three and four parent families and maintaining relationships, not just with surrogates, but more often with other lesbian co-parents or sometimes heterosexual women co-parents or 
um, sometimes pair lesbian couples and gay male couples raising children together, not nirvana, but all with a lot of um, careful thought and often in connected to some of those communities. So I, I just would mention um, that I would love to see the notion of making kin uh, addressed by people who really understand this reproductive justice discourse and the technology um, and try to put that into the conversation. And, um, and I would think about also thinking about surrogacy on the continuum with sex work um, because I think a lot of the same concerns are there including some of the positive notions of could you change the conditions of work to make it something that people could genuinely choose and also what about I think of the notion of um, sexual rights like the rights to have sex let's say you're disabled or you're um, too old or ugly and something I begin to worry about a lot and um, and um, or what if you're just not appealing? I mean, the whole notion that there should be a stigma attached to those who might still want to be sexually active. What about services and the Scandinavian conversations between Denmark and Sweden on that? I think might be relevant to a conversation about rights around surrogacy as well and how to make those relationships um, more acceptable. Uh, to involve more um, reproductive justice. The last thing I just want to say is I just wondered if um, if you'd heard if you knew about the Mossaw people, which become like this fantasy utopian thing for me, but in fact it's very problematic. But one of the chapters of my book are about the Mossaw people of southwestern China, who actually have Tall Bear's fantasy of that kind of matrilineal community, except it's not queer in the sense of sexuality at all. But this is a matrilineal society that has no coupledom at all. And uh, no, they have coupledom, but they're, they're, you live with your maternal family, the extended family household. Over the life course, uh, one member of the family, usually a woman, is the head. All the children born to the women of that household are co-parented by all of the siblings and the grandparents and their siblings of the household. So it's very reminiscent of the Dakota image that was presented and I think fascinating in that regard, um, except it doesn't allow for queer sexuality at all. And in that society, there are no, there's no divorce, there's no singlehood, there's no coupledom. I mean, there's sexual relationship and there could be long-term partnerships, but it's a night visiting system. And it's semi, uh, it seems to be somewhat egalitarian on the level of initiating or rejecting sexual relations. There's no stigma to being asexual there's, because you don't talk about it, it's your private business, because it doesn't affect the family economically or in any, in any other way. So everyone has multiple parents, everyone has kin, everyone has kin, and your reproductive decisions are unrelated to the economy or to your sexuality, which I find pretty fascinating and idyllic for me in the stage. Thanks. Thank you. Anyway. I know I could. Oh, I, um, did I just walk away with the mic? It's um, here on your booth. Oh, okay. Questions for Judith? Oh, no. I think maybe the. I think. Sure, sure. Okay, but. I want to also be clear. I mean, just from my stance, as far as the work that I've done yeah. in the reproductive justice movement, I don't see it as negative or antithetical to understanding querying through kinship. I mean, part of it is one saying, like, actually, folks have been doing these things and have had them in family forms for a really long time, and that there's a need for recognition of that, and part of that has been doing some of the policy work. Uh, I was unclear. What I mean is not the people doing the work. <laughs> I mean that the, that the um, processes that the people in reproductive justice are legitimately criticizing, the kinds of families that are being made, like through transnational surrogacy, are not queer families in the positive sense. Mm -hmm. That's all. I, I misspoke. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. No, 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 no. I don't mean that the intellectuals are making that. No, no, no. What I'm saying is that within, that, there, that the discourse is appropriately critical. And I think of Dorothy Roberts, the critique of the racism, the critique of the colonialism, the critique of the imperial relations, which I completely agree with, but like Wind Dance's paper. But that that's, 
But out of those relations come what we could call queer families, but not the queer families that were the vision of a liberatory movement. That's well, I all. I keep thinking about the politics of respectability. In some ways, it's strategic. You know, there's a kind of norming and so yep. on. That's, uh, that's, that, that, so I, I, I think, I, anyway. But I'm thinking, you know, for the Indian surrogates, however much there might be some agency and all, it's not a queer family project, mm. right? And, and even in Marcin's data, he sees it as a project for even the, most of the surrogates that he interviewed is helping them with their own more nuclear family projects for the most part. Though I had subjects that were really integrating their egg donors and, um, and surrogates in, and really, you know, the kids became, they called them their surrogate sister and all of this kind of stuff. They were the exceptions. But it was part, you know, they were the ones that excited me. And the last little tidbit I'll mention was um, there were three gay men in a trio to pick up on um, ethical non-monogamy. And all of them would have liked to have been fathers, but they felt, and this is now, you know, about um, 15 years ago, that they couldn't do that. They were very active uncles to five of their nieces and nephews. I think I called their story Heather as Five Gay Uncles or something <laughs> like this. Um, be, but they felt like that was just asking too much of their children at that period. It was bad enough, bad enough, but it was hard enough for, to imagine right in that period what their kid would have to deal with be, having gay dads, but to have three gay dads sharing the bed and bringing the kids home just seemed too hard to them, and they felt like they couldn't do it. But anyway, that was their choice, but it was interesting to me. On that anyway. <laughs>